everyone, and thank you for inviting me to come and present on the science of adult learning. I hope that all of you had a chance to see the video through TEDx, uh, which is on knowledgeable versus knowledge able. And as we talk about the science of adult learning, certainly as professionals in the area of early education, we invest greatly in the adults' understanding of how children learn. And it's also important for us to realize that the value of learning not only rests on our ability to understand how children learn, but to understand how each of us learns. And so this next hour will be an exploration for us in relationship to the true science of adult learning. As we focus on the science of adult learning, what we'll be focused on relates to the five aspects of our adult growth. And certainly these are planes of growth across development from preconception, birth into life, through life and into death. And that certainly is our biological, our physical, emotional, social and cognitive states. We'll explore how individuals learn in community as we see that children also do the same thing. Um, the use of technology and certainly by the very factor of this webinar provides this um, as an ex existential experience um, to the value and practice in the work placed on you as professional development. As we will talk about the importance of the data in planning and learning, we'll be using the book How Learning Works. Um, and in this case, these are seven research-based principles for smart teaching, theories, practical ideas, rooted in research as it can enhance your staff training efforts for a more thorough implementation. So a quote by Sir John Lubbock, a lot of what we see depends mainly on what we're looking for. And as you well know, in the many developmental schemas that you use as educators to observe children, uh, to prepare the environment, to redirect activities and or behaviors of children, as they exhibit it, we take a very hard look at our own adult professional development. And what this slide particularly helps us to focus on, uh, in this case, are teaching, learning, and service strategies. One, the value of individuality and community. The very fact that, once again, we look at individualizing the education for all children, how do we do that with adults? So that must be a, a main focus. The next one being the importance of technology. As we focus on the creativity and the value of innovation, technology will continue to be a tool for the purposes of enhancement. The next being value-based professional development. And as organizations, I'm sure that you have your mission, vision, values, goals, and objectives in place for which part of that certainly entails the value of uh, childhood observations and in it, in best practice, the effective nature of our professional development must exist as well. And finally, the fidelity of programming and the use of data as we create observation uh, for children and relate that in communication to parents and families and truly the broader community, whether it be through Head Start agencies or state or local uh, governments, we need to make sure that we're interpreting the data in a way that can help decision making, which again, promotes critical thinking and problem solving. And those are true leadership pieces that I think the data can help us to uh, strengthen the fidelity of our program. So I want to share with you, if you've had the chance to see Michael Wesch, uh, this may bring back some particular experiences from the time that you were a child. So as I'm sure you're all just laughing just a bit, the, the value of what Lucy or uh, Peppermint Patty and Charlie Brown 
helped us to visualize is that learning must be dynamic and we know what it's like when it's not. The book about how learning works in the relationship to how we look at science is the fact that uh, I quote Bacon from 1597, when we identify that knowledge is power. And so when we look into the principles of learning for students, and then the relationship carries over to adults and beyond into our careers, how is it that we focus all aspects in relationship to our identity into how we share that in our career path? If we can have a contextual value of what we experience in our childhood and throughout our adolescent growth into adulthood, as we put together our education to become career-minded and put those into practice, uh, how learning works provides those tools. And in this case, as you um, look at the value of these practices on how learning works, we really are taking the construct of theory and putting it into practice. I also, as a Montessorian, use the methodologies and tenets of Dr. Montessori's principles for hands-on dynamic learning. And certainly I know in early education, there are opportunities across all values of educational curriculums that hands-on experiences uh, promote learning in a dynamic way. So as we move forward, and there will be opportunities for you to pull uh, certain aspects and ask questions at those points, um, if I can be more clear in helping you to see your role, perhaps, as facilitators of learning, again, not only for children, but for the adults in the environment. And that really looks at the administrative body, that looks at the uh, faculty, those who are uh, the direct instructors in the classroom, uh, teachers' assistants, aides, uh, even the um, ancillary classified staff who may perhaps be the, the bus driver or the cook or the librarian, and certainly the value it holds to parents. Because when you have those particular pillars in relationship with the child, the child is going to have a more comprehensive experience and the business will have greater success. So as we get into how learning works, I want to also identify uh, two, two references of uh, elements that we'll use in relationship to how the learning works. And in this case, thinking styles, I'm drawing your attention to Bloom's taxonomy. Benjamin Bloom wrote a book uh, called The Cognitive Domain in 1956. And what he related to was the fact that in this case, human planes of growth and in the framework that we're using today is that we have to look at the biological, what, what is genetically predispositioned to us at birth and how do we incorporate those tendencies through our growth and development uh, physically, emotionally, socially, cognitively, what traits come from those as an environmental impact uh, affect our personality traits, they affect our temperament, they can impede and perhaps grow or decline our moral sense of imperative value, uh, ethics, etc. So as we look at Bloom's taxonomy, although he speaks in reference to the content of knowledge being the most important, and what you, what you see here in this illustration is that knowledge is the foundation for information. It's a way to gather it. You can either have it in lecture form, you can have it in a sensory-based form, but really it's the value of ultimately discovering through observation, listening, locating, naming, etc. the value of the information. As a child, and then truly in our adulthood, as we comprehend that, there is a translation that takes place. Meaning, how is it that the knowledge in our foundation, what we've listened to or what we've touched, how can we contextualize that? Meaning, how can we incorporate it into our own life so that it makes sense? And therefore, can we associate, uh, associate it? And that's the pieces where, if you look on the right, understanding, translating, summarizing, demonstrating, discussing. 
if we can impact activities in such a way to experience those things, then there is going to be more association. Moving up the ladder application is, a, is an opportunity for true leadership to begin emitting from both parents and adult, I mean, from children and certainly their parents and the adults. Again, we're wanting to really focus on the adult learning so that the impact of child-based experiences become more fruitful. And in this case, the application is for the adult to be able to use leadership in the form of critical thinking, problem solving, and decision making. And that decision making then comes through an analysis and a synthesis. So in this uh, uh, pyramid, you can see that it allows the adult ways in which to organize outcomes that could become different if certain variables were either added or uh, taken away. Uh, that synthesis of information then truly draws us to the evaluation of a decision that fosters growth on all sides. So we'll come back to that one in a few moments. The next one is Howard Gardner's Multiple Intelligence. He wrote a book in 1983 called Frames of Mind. And in this way, he spoke about the fact that learning is more revolutionary. It is not just a, a, a initial point or a start point and an end point, that there's always ways in which we can take in information uh, for the purposes of gaining strengths and or compensating for weaknesses. So he identified the seven areas of intelligences, which we all possess and may not necessarily practice. As we know, and certainly Charlie Brown and Peppermint Patty were the cornerstone of the industrialization of our education systems in the mid 20th century, and that's linguistic learning that we are to be sedentary, seated, book open, pencil ready, paper ready, teacher listening or teacher speaking and student listening. Well, in that case, the teacher, the people we are talking about today, need to be more well-rounded in understanding that, in this case, Charlie Brown and Peppermint Patty have a very wide array of learning capacities. We know that in the training of our uh, teachers to observe our children in programs. And therefore, what he identifies is a logical mathematical framework, a musical intelligence, an intrapersonal uh, activity that we become introspective, and interpersonal, meaning that we can look to a broader community. So therefore, uh, perhaps met workshops or webinars or seminars that you've been to, there's a gathering of people for the purpose of becoming project-based and student-centered. Uh, that interpersonal is a check-in for which substantiates our activities in a given uh, area of focus. We then have the bodily kinesthetic and the spatial. And these per two particularly are very important in that if we, if we demand that our classroom environments for children have bodily kinesthetic and spatial awareness features in them, then by right, we as adults need to have them incorporated into our learning patterns as well. So at this point, now that you have an overview of the planes of growth, which developmental plane do you believe is the most influential? So I'll give you a minute to, to uh, answer that question. And then uh, perhaps if there are any questions at this point, we could pause for a few moments to answer them. So Fernando, do we have any questions? No questions at this point, um, okay. just people still working on the polling. Okay, very good. And you can allow the polling for a period of time and we can proceed, yes? Yes, I'll go ahead and close the polling now and share the results and after that we can move on with the presentation. Okay, very good. 
All right. So, folks, thank you for uh, taking an opportunity to give your perspective on which developmental plane you believe is most influential. And I think, uh, as, as I will kind of help us model the value of adult learning, we discuss these particular seven uh, constructs of research-based learning values. Um, one being prior knowledge and learning. Again, when you look at the construct of uh, Charlie Brown and Peppermint Patty in the classroom in the mid 20th century, the teacher as an educator did not necessarily give credence, credit, recognition, or even an awareness to your and my prior knowledge. And yet that has a, a very important cultural aspect, according to Lev Vygotsky, who was a social theorist as a, cog a, a social cognitivist uh, in his theoretical work. And what he believed it, it occurs, you and I practice in our work with children, in the value of the zone of proximal development, creating those sensitive periods of learning and then scaffolding one upon the other in a very constructivist way to build from the simple and the concrete to the uh, complex and abstract, associating it from uh, theory into practice. Well, in this case, the prior knowledge is that your staff, our, 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 our colleagues, our coworkers come together with all of this very important information and there has to be a way for us to help filter that. And so prior knowledge uh, really is orchestrated in a way that we have to be able to provide opportunities for conversation and dialogue so that when content is being discussed, again, a, a value on maybe the prepared environment, then there are perspectives that can be built upon that based on people's prior knowledge. The second is stored knowledge, organization, and learning. And uh, this is where I truly believe that we're driving the theory to the content. In other words, we're taking the content of information and we're contextualizing it based on prior knowledge to stored knowledge. That means that there is a level of importance to it and therefore I can retrieve it at some point in time by truly associating it with past experiences of myself and place it into a professional context. The third is the motivational factor and learning. And in this way, again, it's about ownership, the construct of buy-in by an employee or a colleague or a coworker says that I have belief that this is an important value. And this is where it crosses some of the social construct and the moral construct of our uh, professional capacities in our careers. Um, to kind of go back and give a perspective on the polling of where we believe the most important plane of growth is, is truly around the emotional construct. Because if you, if, if you understand that you and I are all born as humans into the physical environment, the first most important value that we learn is the emotional sense of trust based on physical uh, support from our parents or our guardians. Well, that very next point at which we are uh, moving through life um, in growth of infants, toddlers, et cetera, we are reaching out in an emotional way to build a social a social uh, group. And in building that social group, it's when the physical, emotional, and social structures are in place that cognition really occurs. And that would be where the motivational factor for learning says that there is purpose in my experience. And so if we focus in professional development uh, through the mission, vision, and value of the organization, there must be ways in which to incorporate motivational factors for the part of the staff. Uh, in this case, that leads us to developmental mastery and learning, making sure that we help to uh, coordinate efforts for the fact that as we observe children, again, comparing the learning to how we teach children, that they are an age range of individuals learning at different levels, 
so that same application applies for us as adults that just because we're 18 to 75 doesn't mean that we're all going to learn at the same rate and that developmental mastery is again about that motivation of buy-in that then takes us to the fifth principle for enhanced learning through practice and feedback the value of being able to move backward and forward with each other in conversation around the content, questioning it, using Bloom's taxonomy as a way for feedback through synthesis and analysis. Then we see environment and human development, climate and learning. And in this case, what the book is referring to is the fact that equally important in the prepared environment for children so do adults need that environment in, in a prepared way. The value of making sure that there are appropriate resources and tools for creating the, the learning environment for children. We need to have those same aspects. And then finally, self-directed learning. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about self-directed learning as we get into some key uh, vocabulary words that will kind of help uh, accentuate these seven principles, but ultimately self-directed learning is taking the prior six from a constructivist perspective and being able to illustrate them across a given organization's platform of professional development. So self-directed learning is really about an independence and an autonomy to carry out a job description, roles and responsibilities in an independent way, and yet from an intrapersonal perspective, according to how we cognate in Bloom's theory, that we're touching base with others, that we're getting in uh, to agreements with each other, and the very collaboration and cooperation that occurs will result in uh, advancing the entire cause, both the children and the adults in this case. So this kind of gives you a, a value of importance that uh, as you look at all of the different vocabulary words accentuated in the content, the, the largest words are really the ones that help us to value that students are most important and that learning is, equal, is an equal partner to both students and to us as adults. And then you and I get mixed around uh, throughout the organization with all those various other uh, descriptive words. And it's, uh, it's a value that really helps us to become a, a stronger team. So as, as you all know, you were invited to uh, listen to the uh, TED Talk on knowledgeable versus, or to knowledge able by Michael Wesch. And captivating your interest in that uh, video was an opportunity to look at kind of 20th century perspective on how we uh, have taught people to become valued employees across organizations. As we particularly look at early education and the value we hold to dynamic uh, spatial awareness and learning, um, I, I ask you this question that based on this video, what might become more effective? What, what might we become more effective at doing? So I'll give you a few moments uh, to uh, share your insights around these. Meanwhile, Fernando, do we have any questions? No questions at this point. Okay. All right, well, let's go ahead and move on then. So as we look at the foundation of knowledge, and again, this comes from Bloom's taxonomy, and, and what Bloom's believes is the fact that from a biological, a physiological, in the physical sense of development, both physically developing and the physical environment in which we're developing in, we have an emotional and a social sense of community for which we bond and attach initially to our parents and then eventually to the environments around us, that when those are in place, 
we truly have a level of cognition. And these principles for learning then help us to differentiate, in this case, pedagogy, andragogy, and hudagogy. And so as I relate those, and I'm gonna connect them back to the various aspects, the pedagogy is the role of our um, work. It's to be able to look at the science of teaching as it relates to people learning, people, children, people, other human beings, people as the families, people are the employees or the colleagues or the coworkers. The, the value of engagement of our pedagogy is to really truly inquire uh, the importance of our teaching. Andragogy, on the other hand, in this case, refers to adult learning. And uh, I've given you the references for each of them in you're welcome to go and to uh, pursue them in your own dictionary.com um, references. But the value of andragogy is the fact that there are attitudes about how we learn in adulthood, which oftentimes can be observed when there is a congruency between adults and children, and sometimes when there is indifferences, the value of their, the, the adults' andragogy, their learning patterns may not uh, match well with the child's learning capacities, and therefore they become in conflict. Um, certainly we want to be able to believe and hope that we can all be engaged cooperatively, but that is one insight observationally to how we learn differently. And then the, the last vocabulary word is hudagogy. And you'll actually find that this is not a, a word within the Oxford or Webster's dictionary, uh, but certainly there is a history of hudagogy and that is come to pass, uh, in this case through a WordPress blog, called self-determined learning. And particularly when we're looking at disproportionately impacted children, to adolescents, to adults, we become disproportionately impacted in our educational learning because oftentimes if you have a varied set of learning styles, but you've only been offered a linguistic or a logical mathematical pattern of learning, then you've become conditioned to those. And what I see important in this case, the foundation of knowledge, is that there has to be reciprocal feedback going on sharing of how the value of these cognitive domains and human planes of growth lend to building relationship. And this is a very important feature. Relationship is the key for the value of success. So if you come back to the first poll, I asked you where you believed the, was, was most important. From my standpoint, and many of you, we could have conversations around why you believe the physical is so important, most important, or each of those categories. But I truly believe that for us to be able to have a physical presence of trust, we have to have emotional bond. If we want to be able to reach out socially, we need to have an emotional bond. If we are ready to cognate truly through decision making, in problem through problem solving and critical thinking, then we need to have an emotional bond to how that uh, information connects with us. And therefore, um, it allows the, the true developmental prospects of cognition to come to fruition. So these could be very um, interesting vocabulary words to use in, you know, in your upcoming professional development meetings to help them really look at the study of the fact that each of us holds as adults in the environment a set of pedagogical tools for which we instruct our own learning from an andragogical perspective and how self-determined are we uh, using the hudagogical principles. So from that, we then look at those implications. And for here, I've simply provided you with the uh, website repository where uh, Bloom's Taxonomy and Multiple Intelligences are uh, available for further learning because they certainly give you um, very strong points in which to engage adults. In the, in the last uh, two parts of this experience today, we 
we look at a very uh, thumbprint sketch of the theory to practice. And what we call this uh, is the strategic plan to operationalizing. So if we believe that we have adults in our environment from a professional development standpoint that ideally have a biological, a physical, a, an emotional, a social, and a cognitive sensibility about themselves, then how do we take those, integrate them, and braid them into the strategic plan of the organization? Well, in this case, I provide you with the potential to focus on these um, pillars as ways in which to accomplish your tasks. The first being the innovation and education. So simply by looking at digging down a little deeper in relationship to your pedagogy, each individual's pedagogy, their own learning styles. So in this case, going back to the prior reference, there is a, a self-assessment on multiple intelligence through the repository of business balls for uh, Howard Gardner's. Um, and each individual can identify through that self-assessment the tools of what benefits them in their strongest learning intelligences and in their weakest ones. And then organizationally, that takes us to the next one is the theory to practice is that you can actually contextualize that learning that you will find in the organization where the strongest pedagogists are. You can find in the organization where hudagogically self-determined learning may appear through these various intelligences in stronger ways and in weaker ways. And uh, then the matching of those experiences, i.e. the data that drives the decisions, will help your team uh, become stronger at leaning on others when they have a particular weakness, as well as others who may then lend greater support in their leadership when they have certain strengths among those intelligences. And then what ideally you will be able to focus on is the, the last pillar is the cultural diversity within the society. In this case, the agency and potential related partners. Uh, when you, when you take time to go back and look at Bloom's taxonomy, what you'll then continue to see beyond the six knowledge, uh, the points of acquiring knowledge, is that he has a second and a third category. The second category, and this is particularly where the cultural diversity becomes very evident and again connects to the theories of Vygotsky about around uh, uh, cultural cognition, is the fact that we teach to the affect meaning what are our attitudes and our feelings around those prospects of whatever ideas that you're trying to get across to your organizational um, leadership and uh, be able to have impact. And uh, his third category then speaks about the psychomotor skill level that we're building into the organization. So that in turn, again, creates a strength in the cultural diversity within the society, i.e. the agency itself. So with those four pillars, we'll look at this last piece uh, to help you understand how we implemented it. And it's called the 2020 session, in which the first 20, when you're setting up organizationally your opportunities of a staff training or a materials training or a policy and procedural training, the, the importance of it in the first 20 minutes would be to identify the overview of what the expectations are. Uh, perhaps it may be a, a, new, um, a new set of policies that are going to be implemented. From those policies, we'll say as an example, you are going to help build prompts by setting up tables, maybe three or four different tables with a group of three or four It'll depend on the configuration of your group, but that they have prompts that help them to begin to have conversation around the policies and procedures that are new. And then um, as facilitators, you can have prescribed lead-ins that help the conversation become more in-depth. Then that importance, again, going through those seven stages, when we get to the seventh one where it's self-directed learning, we take that 20 minute focus period and identify that, okay, we've had this much information, 
Now we need to begin to uh, comprehend it and absorb it. It's time to analyze it. So then it helps you uh, to move to the second uh, time frame. And these are opportunities that you finish the overview, you finish talking. Now it's time for the tables to talk. So truly based on the prompts and the lead-ins, you now uh, help uh, invite people at the tables to become facilitators and recorders and presenters so that everyone's getting an opportunity to incorporate all of those different learning intelligences with the thought processes, in this case using Blooms, uh, to, to move through those seven practices. So in other words, the buy-in, the value of motivation and incorporation and uh, recall all become activities that are contextualized in their true experience. So even though you're introducing new policies and procedures, they're actually living them through the facilitator's work to communicate with the small group, the recorder to take down copious notes on things that have been said, and then the presenter is the person who will uh, take the lead as we move to the third uh, 20 minutes. And that's when now the full groups, based on the facilitators' goals to create those opportunities, have the spokespeople to, or the presenters, to read those things out loud so that every other group has an opportunity to listen while the leadership of this particular group has the opportunity to, uh, to share the knowledge, in this case, creating the opportunity for networking. Because at that point, you may find that, you know, we'll just say there are three tables of five people, that in those, in those uh, 15 people, um, there may be one at another table and two at another table that haven't heard that before. But now because they have heard this coming from the first table presentation, it offers them the opportunity to begin to network with that person for which they may not have networked with them before. And again, that reinforces both the construct of taking content, in this case from Bloom's cognition of foundation knowledge, to feel good about the fact that I've made a new networker and how can they practice those things more readily in the school program. And again, that comes back to the value of the pedagogy, in this case the 320 series, is the pedagogical instruction to get them from step A to step C, A being the conversation, the overview, B being the second 20 minutes to have a conversation and discuss it, to contextualize it, and the third one is to receive the information and uh, find ways in which then they can connect it for themselves. There's another a style that although we don't necessarily have time to go into it altogether today um, is a very uh, inspiring uh, process for which you can also organize uh, staff development um, and it's called the ed camp uh, structure it's from schoolcraft and in this case it, uh, the use of this model allows for small groups to individualize information and share it back through verbal communication or digitally when it's available, uh, in this case, a webinar perhaps. And using this structure can be embedded into that second and third 20 minutes. Um, the, the way it works is the fact that you can actually identify a construct for which all of this information is made available to everyone, but depending upon people's attention spans, perhaps they've gotten all they needed from the first uh, 20 minutes, and they might want to go to the second table and listen a little bit more, or even to the third table and back again. And so uh, the construct of the fact that you're having uh, someone who is uh, the facilitator is leading the prompts and the lead-ins, the second uh, person is the note taker or the person, um, yes, taking the notes from the experience, those notes are going to be made available after everything is said and done in a common place for everyone to access. And that may be very helpful for some who may choose to go from one to another 
uh, because of the fact that they can reach back from the from uh, the the staff meeting, we'll say, and access the information in writing because they are someone who is linguistic but needs an oral remuneration to remind them on what those uh, uh, conversations were discussed and the decisions that were made around them. So this is another uh, possible resource for you. It also gives you a word map on helping to understand uh, what EdCamp provides, that, that it's uh, truly a uh, language-based uh, maker space, if you want to call it that. It uh, creates uh, actual physical movement uh, from one table to another, or from one activity or lesson to another. And again, these concepts are uh, really proving uh, prosperous for organizations. So the last piece then is to just demonstrate to you how that works, the first 20. It allows for the establishment of communication, program, and operational goals. And in this case, you, you have the opportunity to, in the design of the planning of your work, create the data points that in this case build the baseline, the delivery of goals and objectives, and then the assessment. And again, that's just a, an overview of those principles. The second would be for your opportunity in your planning to use any one of these or more. This is certainly not an exhaustive list, but these could be the types of topics discussed uh, during the uh, second 20 tabletop activity. And then again, the third is really for the opportunity for the staff and faculty to network and to share outcomes. Um, ideally, it's their ideas and their resources and their outcomes connecting to the objectives that the facilitator has uh, organized the purpose of the meeting to begin with. And again, what this is ultimately doing is truly offering the value for idea sharing and team building. And so with that, I want to share this. It's about a four minute clip um, that just talks about how we see this change uh, in, in front of us.
by practice, but we're not doing that. So we now have developed this theory of change that says we need to focus on the development of the adults who are important in kids' lives. So try this. How does that work? We need to focus on their skills, their needs, in order for them to be better, more effective parents, in order for them to be better prepared to be employable, which would enhance the economic stability of the family, which is also good for children. Second of all, we looked at many people in preschool programs and child care centers. And we said, what are we doing to build those skills in the providers? They need skill building as well. And also the community can help to build and reinforce the capacities that parents need. And the community also includes programs in which the people who work in the programs have sufficient skills. Third of all, what are the major sources of toxic stress in this community and how can we reduce them? Moving it up to a policy level, how are our policies strengthening communities' abilities to reduce sources of toxic stress and caregivers' abilities to provide what kids need? The development of our human capital is our future. The development of a productive workforce is our future. The development of a healthy population is our future. This kind of future orientation is critical for healthy society. It's critical for a thriving business. It's critical for successful environmental relationships to raise children. It's all about being able to plan for the future, to have a future. And that's why this is so important. So as you can see from this particular video clip, it's a small illustration of the value of what, in this case, your agencies do with young children, with their families, and with the individuals that you employ, or for us as employees, there is a true buy-in in relationship as we look at the learning outcomes, and that is that the, the number one being to deepen knowledge of data sources for establishing communication goals comes from very importantly two primary sources and that is the emotional relationship that we have ties us into the value of the, the simplicity of our experience and the second is that in order for that to occur we truly have to be able to understand each other in our relationship. The second being the enhancement and sustainability of community partnerships as related to program goals and objectives. I truly believe, and again, this vignette shows you a very small uh, illustration of this construct, is the fact that we have to be in communication among the roles and responsibilities uh, as they relate to the policy that we work by, because otherwise uh, we're we're missing you know, a portion of what I call the four-legged uh, table. And that is that the child represents one leg, the family and community represents one leg, the school represents one leg, and then the people within the school represent the other. And without one of those legs, uh, the, the, the table is sure to topple. And so how do we create that sustainability that as an agency in, uh, the business of school, we've moved from just simply teaching children uh, to being educators and mentors of the entire community. Number three discusses the fact that we gain new strategies relating to ongoing adult development and learning as it relates to individual and organizational goals and practice applications. If we have a difficult time adhering to determining what connects us, we're not going to do it. There's not going to be good employment relations in relationship to carrying out a task if we can't understand why the theory uh, relates to our practice or to, in this case, what I spoke about earlier, and that's prior knowledge. And then the last one, the fourth outcome is that we learn from peers on new approaches to planning high impact developmental relatable activities. And again, I've given you two different examples 
in the use of the seven research principles, uh, these two examples in the 320 process and the EdCamp process are both ways in which to incorporate prior knowledge in a, in a way that, uh, as I spoke, the value between the presenter and the note taker and the uh, facilitator allows a team related experience. And in this way, it helps us in relationship, not biologically connected, but truly based on community to be educators of others across all of those legs of the table. Uh, in this case, the book, as you know, um, is uh, a reference to the work that we've done today. Um, it offers uh, tenants from early childhood to uh, 12th grade, as far as educators. And truly, it, I believe that it allows ones here that are brand new to education, as well as those who are uh, decades experienced in education uh, to really hone in and fine tune in the area of course design and uh, classroom pedagogies. So with that, I leave you with a couple of quotes, actually there are three. Uh, one is combined between Maria Montessori and John Dewey, Maria Montessori being a pedagogist a practitioner and John Dewey being an environmentalist as an educator, that education is not merely preparation for life, education is life itself. And from that standpoint, um, I would ask you the third poll, and that is that based on the 320 structure and the theory of change, what is the most important ingredient for professional development from your standpoint? Norman, I have opened the poll question. I'll give it a minute or so, um, and then I'll share the results with you. Great, thank you. And uh, finally, as we end our uh, time together today, I leave you with this last quote by William Shakespeare, that all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. And I think that that's particularly appropriate here given the fact that certainly during the time of Shakespeare, we had approximately 1,100 uh, words in the English vocabulary. And today, we have over 530,000 words in our vocabulary. And what that entails is an opportunity for us to become more uh, broad in our perspective as it relates to the fact that as a school, we're not just educators of children, but we're educators of the community. And the opportunities for us to bridge, in this case, the theory of changes, lowering of toxic stress to children, is that we really truly have to be able to cultivate and nurture the value of the adults fulfilling those roles. So with that, address any questions, uh, but certainly I want to thank you all for participating today. And uh, if you find it uh, of interest beyond the questions uh, that you'd like to have further conversation, you can email me at nlorenzedd at gmail.com. Fernando, do we have any questions? No questions at this point. Uh, the poll results are in. Um, the last question, uh, getting all the information uh, received 7% of the answers. Willingness to participate received 50%, as well as networking to share common goals uh, received 50%, and completing the checklist uh, obtained a 7%. Wonderful. And, and certainly those last two is uh, folks are perhaps still here. As, as we look at the value of the willingness to participate is the fact that you're obviously going to participate and getting all of the information. The construct of networking to share common goals is equally an important one. And it again gives us 
uh, perspective building to understand that to some people it's very important uh, as we prioritize A versus when we prioritize it in the structure of B, C, or D, right? I think that um, the polling processes that we've experienced during this exercise really help us to understand that um, there's more than one answer and more than one way in this case to play many parts. So thank you once again. We will make this uh, presentation available to you uh, via the Region 9 Head Start Association website. And uh, once again, I'm honored to have presented this to you and I look forward to uh, further communications. So everyone have a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. Uh, all of the material presented in this presentation will be uh, uploaded shortly to our website, um, as well a, as a copy of the recording of this presentation if you decide to rewatch it and um, revisit it. Thank you again, and uh, have a pleasant afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence, again. Thank you. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye now.